Hello students. Now we are going to learn a very important component of pharmacovigilance that is causality assessment. In today's session we will understand the concept of causality assessment, methods used in causality assessment, the definition of signal and methods that are used in signal detection. Causality assessment is basically assessment of a relationship between drug treatment and the occurrence of an adverse event. That means it is a method by which you can attribute an adverse event to a particular drug with evidence. This method of assessment is subjective, which means the inference is drawn largely based on a clinician's judgment of the cause-effect relationship. There are two important steps in causality assessment. The first step includes collection of relevant patient data and the second step involves use of methods to establish a correlation between adverse events and drugs. So now, in the first step, what type of data is collected? This data which is collected includes complete demographic details of the patient, details of the drug, medical history of the patient, the time of occurrence of adverse event and so on. In the second step, a correlation is established between adverse event and drug. So how exactly do they manage to do that? Let us understand this in the next slide. So now let us understand the methods that are used to establish correlation. These methods include first use of opinion of experts clinical judgment and global introspection, which is the first method. Second method is use of algorithms. And third method is probabilistic or Bayesian methods. So now let us understand the first method that is opinion of expert, clinical judgment and global introspection. So what is done here? The experts evaluate the data and they express their opinion. Now who are these experts? These experts are medical doctors specialized in the respective disease. This method has been developed by WHO and Uppsala Monitoring Center. Now, as per this method, the probable association between a drug and an adverse event exists at six different levels. The first is called conditional or unclassified. Let us understand this. Now, if you have a patient who has taken the drug, he or she develops the adverse event. The patient has filled the adverse event reporting form, but in that form failed to mention the time of adverse event. So in the absence of data, an inference on association between drug and adverse event cannot be conclusively made. This is called conditional or unclassified association. The second category is unlikely. If there is a patient who is suffering from chronic kidney disease, this patient has an episode of toothache and an analgesic is given to that particular patient. After taking the drug, the patient complains of swelling in the feet. Now in this case, even though there is swelling in the feet, 
one must remember that the patient is suffering from chronic kidney disease and therefore swelling in the feet is very common in such patients therefore swelling is very unlikely to be due to the analgesic that is taken so when the adverse event is due to some underlying disease it is called unlikely the third type is unaccessible consider there is a patient who took a drug for the treatment of congestive heart failure now after taking the drug the patient experiences seizure now the adverse event here is seizure but in literature there is no documented evidence on occurrence of seizure with that particular drug also after stopping the drug whether the seizure has stopped or not this data was not made available in the form therefore in such a case there is neither complete data nor any literature evidence to support the occurrence of seizure so such type of association is called unaccessible the fourth type of association is called possible which means that if there is data to show that adverse event occurred after taking the drug then in that case it is termed as possible that means whatever adverse event has occurred it should be pharmacologically plausible the next category is called probable probable means suppose if an adverse event has occurred but that adverse event which has occurred cannot be explained by some other drug or disease then in that case it is called probable and the final category is certain it means that adverse event can neither be explained with the help of any drug or disease and most importantly there is positive rechallenge what is positive rechallenge this means that if you stop the drug the adverse event stops when if you start the drug the adverse event resumes so this is like a confirmation that there is an association between the drug and the adverse event so in summary remember that conditional is a category when adverse event even though seen the data is inadequate to confirm the association the association is called unlikely if the adverse event is seen due to some other concomitant drug or disease the association is called unaccessible if the adverse event reported cannot be verified with other reports or the information is insufficient to arrive at a decision the association is called possible when there is time to event relationship between the administration of a drug and the adverse event the association is called probable if the adverse event cannot be explained by any other drug or disease and the association is called certain when there is a plausible time relationship with the drug intake now what is this plausible time relationship you take the drug at 10:15 now is it possible to have the adverse event also at 10:15 no it is not possible it may occur after say at 10:30 or it may occur at 11:30 so after sufficient time has passed after taking the drug if you get adverse event then you can say there is plausible time relationship of that adverse event with the drug intake this is the first point next is it cannot be explained by any other drug or disease this is a second point and third point is there is positive rechallenge which means you stop the drug adverse event stops you start the drug adverse event starts now we move on to causality assessment based on algorithms now this algorithms are questionnaires that are used to collect the data to establish a correlation between drug and adverse drug reaction 
there are different types of algorithms that are used. For example, Naranjo, Lasagna's, Grammars. As an example, we are going to understand Naranjo in the present session. Now this Naranjo scale or algorithm is named after Naranjo and colleagues who developed it in 1981. This is a 10 item scale, which means there are 10 questions in this particular scale. The response to each question is recorded in the form of yes, no and don't know. To each response, a certain score is given. Let us understand this with the help of an example in the next slide. So you all can see this particular scale, which is nothing but the Naranjo algorithm. You can see there are 10 questions and response to each question is documented as either yes, no or don't know. And finally, you have a score which is assigned. So let us understand the scoring system with an example. So consider the first question. Are there previous conclusive reports on this reaction? So if the answer to this question is yes, a score of plus one is given. If the answer to this question one is no, then in that case, a score of zero is given. Similarly, if the answer is do not know, then in that case also the score of 0 is given. For the second question, did the adverse event appear after the suspected drug was administered? So here, if the response is yes, a score of plus 2 is given. Whereas, if the response is no, then remember in this case, adverse event can appear either before taking the drug or after taking the drug. Now, when we do causality assessment, we assess causality or we say that the causality, causal relationship exists only if the adverse event is occurring after taking the drug. But there could be reports where it is taking place before the drug is administered. So, here for this second question, if the response is no, in that case, a score of minus 1 is given, which means that adverse event did not occur after taking the drug, but it occurred before taking the drug. Similarly, for do not know, the score is 0. So, this is the standardized validated scoring system which has been developed by Naranjo and colleagues when they developed this particular algorithm. Now, what you have to learn essentially from this is that how exactly do they interpret these scores? So after all the 10 items are scored, what exactly do they do with that scores? So to understand the interpretation, we will go to the next slide. So suppose after you have scored all the items, your total score is more than 9. Then in that case, it means there is a definite relationship between that adverse event and the drug. If your score is between 5 to 8, that means there is a probable relationship. If your score is between 1 to 4, that means there is a possible relationship. And if your score is 0, that means this particular adverse event is unlikely to be associated with the drug. So this is how the scores derived from Naranjo algorithm are interpreted to do the causality assessment. The next important method which is used for causality assessment is called the Bayesian method or the Bayesian model. Now this is based on statistics. Now Bayesian method, they rely on prior probability while assessing causation. So what exactly is that? Now for the purpose of this particular topic, the statistical part I will not explain because it is beyond the scope of the syllabus, but I will explain the philosophy behind the Bayesian methods. So for that, I will take one example. So consider there is an old man. Okay. Now this old man is in a habit of misplacing his spectacles. So every day he spends time finding where he has kept them because he keeps forgetting it. So consider in the last month of 30 days, he misplaced his specs about 25 times. Means on out of 30 days, 25 days, he misplaced his specs. 
and he found it in the kitchen all 25 times. Now today is the 31st day and again he has misplaced his specs. So which part of the house do you think he is much more likely to find that? Last 30 days, 25 times he has misplaced and he has found it in the kitchen. So today on the 31st day, if he misplaces it, very high probability exists that he will go first and find search in the kitchen. So basically, Bayesian model works on a similar principle. That is, they rely on prior probability of occurrence of a particular adverse event while assessing the causality. Next, we come to an important concept called signal. Now, when a drug is marketed based on the surveillance that is done, that is the post-marketing surveillance, a lot of data is generated pertaining to the safety and efficacy of that particular drug. So, based on the emerging data, if we study the pattern of this particular data, we will get some idea about what is the risk or what is the benefit that is associated with that particular drug. So the hypothesis of risk with a medicine or it could even be a hypothesis of benefit with a medicine based on the data that is generated or the arguments that support the risk or benefit associated with a particular drug is what you call as a signal. So, signal basically may change over time, okay, as new data is collected, as new information gets added, the hypothesis associated with the drug about risk or benefit may change. So, now as we, so now we have seen what is signal, so we will understand what are the methods that are used in signal detection. Now, these methods in signal detection are not part of your syllabus, but since I have introduced you to the concept of what is a signal, I will just list out the methods that are used for the sake of your knowledge. So, there are qualitative methods and quantitative methods. So, in the quantitative methods, you have the denominator method, which includes cumulative scan, time scan, poison method, the numerator method, short memory schemes, proportional reporting ratios and Bayesian data mining techniques. So now as we come towards the end of the chapter of pharmacovigilance, I will quickly summarize the need for pharmacovigilance. So pharmacovigilance helps in generating real world evidence on safety outcomes. Why do you need this? Because the data that is generated from preclinical and clinical study is obtained in a very controlled environment. You define the experimental conditions, you define eligibility criteria and therefore you cannot entirely rely on that data. Next is there is multiple site launch of drugs and therefore you need a lot of data on safety outcomes because depending on the type of patient the data that is being generated it may vary over a period of time. Next important thing is that the patient and physicians preferences are changing nowadays. Patients also have access to a lot of information pertaining to drug on the internet and therefore all the safety related information should be made available to them. Next important aspect is that there is ready availability of substandard medicines in the market which could be associated with some adverse outcomes. Next important aspect is many of the drugs nowadays are increasingly over the counter and therefore the monitoring of their safety is very essential and therefore as a healthcare professional pharmacovigilance is very essential aspect and should be done routinely for this particular drugs. So please go through these questions and check whether you are able to answer them. You can also prepare your own notes and send to me for checking. So as far as pharmacovigilance is concerned, that's all for now. Thank you very much. In the next session, we will start with pharmacoeconomics.